It's working? Yeah. All right, welcome to the colloquium. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Professor Chandrasekhar Khare from UCLA, who will tell us about modularity of Galva representations from Ramanujan to Sayers conjecture. Okay, is that all right? So uh, yeah, thanks uh, so much for for the invitation. I'm spending my sabbatical year, more, more most of my year here, so I've just started, and uh, it's good to be back. Uh, so I'm going to talk about something which actually I've not worked on recently. It's something some work which I did maybe I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. But in the last uh, few months, I've been going around giving talks on uh, similar topics. Uh, a friend of mine, Basi Dixhoven, passed away uh, unfortunately very early. A uh, few earlier this year, and I gave a talk in his uh, memory, maybe a few months ago. And he had he has written a, he, he had written a book on uh, efficient algorithms, or at least theoretically uh, good algorithms to compute uh, the Ramanujan tau function tau of p. So I kind of looked at uh, looked at that book and then kind of gave a talk related to that. So some have uh, kind of uh, been talking about this. Uh, for the last two few months. Uh, if you want to hear more about what I'm doing currently, I'm going to give a talk at IIT Bombay in a couple of weeks in which I'm going to talk about other kinds of modularity, which will be closer to the work I'm doing right now. All right. Anyway, so this is uh, something about uh, Sayers conjecture and the relation to the Ramanujan tau function. So I'm going to kind of draw a line between this uh, old paper of Ramanujan in 1916 called on, on, on some arithmetical functions. It was published in uh, 1916, and it's, see, it's had a remarkable influence on the development of number theory across the 20th century. So uh, I think in some sense, that one, can argue, one can make an argument for the fact that that paper set off a uh, set of developments, which uh, led eventually to uh, why is the solution of Fermat's last theorem, why are the work of uh, Sayer and Sunit and Dyer in the 1960s and 1970s to try and understand Ramanujan's, some of Ramanujan's remarkable uh, observations, particularly to do with the prime 691. Okay, so I'll come to the prime 691. Uh, so this is going to be some sort of historical kind of uh, lecture, just I'll be telling you a story. And but in the end, maybe I'll kind of tell you something which is a little more modern in terms of, uh, uh, as I said, Basi Dixon's book, along with several others, uh, where he came up with an algorithm which uses kind of Galois representations to compute some coefficients, uh, which are the Ramanujan tau function. And also I'll end with some question which I've kind of thought about for many years, which I've made no progress on, about uh, counting number of, uh, counting certain sorts of two-dimensional uh, mod p representations of the absolute Galois group of Q. So somehow that's the plan. Most of the talk, most of the talk is going to be somewhat historical. Uh, and kind of, uh, maybe I kind of, I started thinking about size conjecture when I, when I came back to TIFR in 1995 after my PhD. So, okay. So maybe this is going to be uh, catching up with some of that. All right. So, uh, the so Sayer's conjecture and Sayer himself in the paper he wrote in Duke in 1987 or published in 1987. Uh, he kind of thinks of his conjecture as a kind of a, as a part of a Mod P Langlands program. At that time, perhaps it was still somewhat fledgling. But since his work, uh, I mean, various aspects of his uh, of his of his conjecture have kind of fitted into or have given rise to pro, uh, to developments which are now thought of as being part of the Piadic Langlands program or the Mod P Langlands program. So, and also Sayer's conjectures are just the first kind of conjecture one can make. Well, there's, there's, there have been vast generalizations of the conjecture, but unfor, the proof has not, I mean, the, the only known, the only case which has been proven is Sayer's original conjecture. So, in some sense, though I'm talking about some result which is 10, 15 years old, in, in some sense, then, in, in terms of the global theory, there has been no further results, right? So, uh, so this is kind of, so Sayer's original conjecture is that which is proven, but the conjecture really the thing has been generalized to many more situations. And some more technical aspects of the conjecture, like his definition of weights and so on, has played a big role in the in the various this kind of mod p or periodic Langlands program. So also in the, the, the mod p Langlands, one might wonder is it some kind of niche kind of technical thing? But on the other hand, it does kind of imply the characteristic zero uh, kind of cases which people have traditionally cared about. For example, Colmes. Uh, I mean, Sayer credit, credits Pierre Colmes with the observation that Sayer's conjecture that his conjecture implies the modularity of elliptic curves over Q. Right, so this is a case of the Langlands program, which predated Langlands. Uh, and Taniyama, in some wake form at least, had uh, thought about this question of how we can relate elliptic curves to modular forms. And when is the work uh, of Kolmich? Sorry? When is the work of Kolmich? Kolmich, yeah. I mean, uh, so, so Sayer, of course, this, this, this uh, deduction is, uh, is made in Sayer's paper, but he credits, uh, he credits Kolmich with the 
with pointing out uh, pointing out the observation. Yeah, yeah. All right, and so in, in fact, uh, uh, many years ago, or so soon after I started working here, I, I, I observed that says, I mean, it's a very small observation again, but I observed that says conjecture implies Artin's conjecture for a particular case, two-dimensional odd representation. So the mod P version of uh, the Langlands program, which of course uh, does imply the Chi 6 zero version, because for example, Artin's conjecture is considered kind of one of the sort of uh, important cases of the Langlands program. So it's something, it's about some holomorphic, holomorphy of L series attached by art into two dimensional or n dimensional representations of Galois groups. All right, so okay, so, I've, uh, so I want to talk about some of these things, but I'm going to go back much further. I'm going to start with, uh, with Ramanujan's uh, 1916 paper where he makes some observations about the tau function. Then I'm going to define what the tau function is. And in fact, this, uh, uh, these observations kind of influence the subject right throughout. And in, in fact, when Jean Pierre Mathaberg and I proved, started proving uh, the Sayers conjecture. Somehow, our first, the first cases we proved of Sayers conjecture were related to the Ramanujan delta function. So, the Ramanujan delta function has played, did play a key role even in the, in the formulation of Sayers conjecture, what led to the formulation of Sayers conjecture, and in the initial results uh, to do with Sayers conjecture. Any questions? All right. All right. So, let me start. I mean, so I've been, uh, kind of preparing for this lecture, I kind of looked at Ramanujan's yeah, paper. Yeah. Okay, what is the relation between tau and delta function? I didn't. <laughs> All right, I didn't kind of quite follow the question. Okay, maybe I'll kind of move on. So, okay, so, so in this paper, he just starts with this infinite product. It's like a some, some sort of generating function, and then you expand it in powers of x, right? Uh, and the, the coefficients of the expansion are called the tau function, right? So you start with this function. And uh, this is the function he studies uh, initially purely as a combinatorially kind of defined series, uh, and and he kind of make, he made a study of these uh, of these coefficients tau n. Okay, so now the other other functions which kind of play a role in this are, are these more elementary functions. So there's the sum the sigma k function, which is just the sums of divisors of uh, when sigma k of n is just the sum of divisors uh, of n raised by kth bar, and then you kind of regularize it and define it for sigma k zero to be a half of the zeta function evaluated in minus k. Now this might seem unmotivated, but somehow it's related to expansions of Eisenstein series. Uh, okay, so this is just a definition of an elementary arithmetic function, okay, which is the sums of divisors function. And in fact, Ramanujan's paper is concerned by, to begin with with these functions or some, 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 some sort of things you do with these functions. All right, so this is the, this is the, function which he's going to convolve. Okay, so he so Ramanujan starts his paper by looking at this kind of sum he defines, which is summation Rs of n, right? So which is some convolved sum of these sigma R sigma S. Uh, so it's this particular thing, right? So it's uh, so you fix an integer, so fix a positive integer as uh, R and S, and you kind of define this function sigma Rs of n to be this uh, this summation, right? Sigma R zero, sigma S n, etc. And then somehow he wanted to find formula to find, find kind of ways of estimating this or kind of uh, yeah, uh, studying this, uh, con this convolved sum of the of this sigma function. And he found and he, and he wrote it in the following way some of the dominant terms when you try to kind of evaluate this thing are these functions or these first two terms, right? So it's, uh, somehow they are again to do with the, the sigma function, sums of divisors function, but except you, you look at sigma r plus s plus one of n while you're convolving sigma r and sigma s. And there's also this, there's so some of the, these two terms, uh, right? The two leading terms coming from the sigma value or with index with different integers, r plus s plus one and r plus s minus one. Now, typically, I think one is going to be interested in r and s odd, uh, and some of these, uh, these th this convolves some in the, in, the, in the theory of modular form that's going to come from multiplying Eisenstein series. And, uh, okay, so anyway, so some of this has something to do with multiplying Eisenstein series in, in the case when r and s are both odd. Uh, and then R plus S plus one and R plus S minus one also both odd. Okay, so somehow you kind of uh, look at this convolved sum, uh, you write it in the following way, and then there's an extra term which you don't quite know about, and that is the error term, right? So somehow you write it in terms of the first two main terms, and then you, then uh, Ramanujan call, calls it ERSN, and the gamma is the usual gamma function, and zeta is a Riemann zeta function. Right? So and ERS is some error term. Okay, and somehow in, the, the, in that paper, he wants to evaluate this, uh, he wants to say something about these, uh, about these convolved sums. Okay, any questions about? Uh... All right. 
Okay, so now, for example, for certain values of, uh, of, of R, R, what matters somehow mainly is R plus S. So when R plus S, for example, is six, then this error term is zero, and then you get some explicit uh, evaluation of this convolved sub of sigma three three n, right? So that's kind of it's related to sigma seven n, and it's the coefficients come from the gamma and zeta functions. Okay, but now Ramanujan's particular interest, so somehow if R plus S equal to ten, something interesting happens. Then this quantity E R S n is not equal to zero. And then uh, Ramanujan observes that the kind of error term is then connected with this function tau n, which I've defined, right? Which was defined kind of as some discriminatorily in terms of some power series and so on. Right. So some of the analysis of ERSN is there, and then this ERSN turns out up to scaling, it turns out to be the same as tau n. Right. So that's for R plus S equal to 10. For example, a good a good number to keep in mind for R plus S equal to 10 is R equal to 3 and S equal to 7. Right? So some of that has to do with certain modular forms of weight four and eight, Eisenstein series of weight four and eight. Okay, so somehow, I mean, okay, so that's, so that's, uh, that's what he was actually interested in. And he wanted to estimate these error terms, ERSN, and somehow find properties of these error terms. Okay. So, okay, but now to understand kind of this in a more kind of uh, maybe standard language, now we are gonna to switch to the world of modular forms, and we are gonna, in, instead of thinking of this, uh, this uh, power series in terms of X, and we are just gonna set X equal to, e raised power of two pi i z, right? And then now, now rather than thinking of it formally, I'm going to think of it the, the corresponding thing you get as a modular form, right? And it turns out to be a certain cusp form of weight 12. All right, so, okay, so, uh, so what, is, what, is, what is this way of modular form? It is, uh, it is certain functions on the upper half plane. Uh, we define them m k, m k s l 2 z c. So these are modular forms of weight k on the full modular group s l 2 z acting by Mobius transformations on the Poincare upper half plane. And these are functions which, are, which have a Fourier series. Uh, so they're invariant under zz plus one, and uh, they have this kind of following Fourier series. Uh, summation a and qn for n becoming equal to zero. And then they have this more subtle symmetry under Mobius inversion, which is that f of my minus one upon z is equal to z to the k times f of z, right? And the k is a weight. So the weight enters in terms of the transformation property under Mobius inversion. Okay, so these are only modular forms of level one, and their interest for as far as the Ramanujan tau function is that the tau functions are going to be Fourier coefficients of a particular modular form of weight 12 and level one. Okay, so uh, because this group SL2Z is generated by these transformations, Z goes to Z plus one and this Mobius inversion, you have a richer kind of apparently richer symmetry, F of A Z plus B upon C Z plus D is equal to this thing, C Z plus D to the K times F of Z. And uh, so we got within the subspace of modular forms of weight k, you can also consider a subspace whose uh, constant term, who's, who, which vanishes at infinity. So that is called the space of cusp form. And typically it's of co-dimension one uh, in mk. And uh, somehow this mk is, or, or is, is zero unless uh, k is bigger than equal to zero and is an even integer. And, uh, and whenever mk, whenever k is bigger, bigger than equal to four and even, then mk, the space of weight k modular forms on sl to z is non-zero. Right, so somehow this is the, these are some basic facts about these modular forms. And the fact that MK vanishes for K odd for, in, for the group SL2Z has some consequences in terms of the Galois theory, it can kind of Galois representations, which it, spaces of modular forms can account for. Right, somehow there's a parity constraint on the side of Galois representations. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, Okay, so now some particular modular form one can write down by just by sort of some averaging process is are uh, these uh, explicit forms of these Eisenstein series of weight K. And uh, they have this uh, particular Fourier expansion uh, and they certain make sense and a non-zero for K becoming equal to four and even uh, where the non-constant Fourier coefficients are these simple arithmetic functions which Ramanujan was interested in, sigma K minus one N, right? So sums of divisors of N to the K minus one. There's a somewhat more mysterious constant term which has to do with the zeta function. And it's the Kate Bernoulli number. And yeah, but, but it's, a, it's the, the non-constant Fourier coefficients at least are rather explicit and simple. Right? So this, this, the, there's always some, there's always one modular form in this space as long as K is bigger than equal to zero, uh, K is bigger than equal to four and even. And somehow the, 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 the one normalizes this uh, to, so that the constant term is one. You kind of make it one by multiplying it, by scaling it. And uh, the, the way Eisenstein series of weight four and six, which Ramanujan in this paper in 1916 denotes by Q and R, and they've been called that since often since then, uh, they play a somewhat significant role. Uh, yeah, so, so this E4 and E6 have some sort of special role in the theory. 
And in general, I mean, so one has a decomposition that the space of modular forms of 8K is, a, is the direct sum of the, of the line spanned by the Eisenstein series plus the complementary space, which is the space of cusp forms. Right? And some of the, the error terms that Ramanujan was studying, R plus S equal to less 6 and so on, the fa fact that the error terms are zero uh, were, were partly because of the fact that the space of cusp forms vanishes for more values of K than, than the space MK. Right? The first time you have a cusp form, is of uh, is for k equal to twelve. I cannot hear any other questions. So should I should I ignore them or, or yeah? I don't know. Yeah, maybe later on I can. All right, and you can put together modular forms in in in, in or put them all together by looking at the direct sum over, over the space of modular forms of weight k. And this turns out to be a polynomial algebra in these two modular, modular forms of weight four and weight six, which are called Q and R. And it's almost some sort of uh, uh, it's a graded algebra and uh, you uh, provide you give the weights four and six to these uh, two Eisenstein series. And uh, okay, so the other things, other kind of gross thing, other, other kind of general things one can say about, uh, about the space MK is that you can have a formula for the dimension, which is uh, the dimension is roughly K by 12. And the space of cusp forms vanishes for all k less than 12. And the first time it does not vanish, it's one dimensional for S12, SL2Z. And it is, uh, it is uh, uh, the corresponding space, uh, the, I mean, delta, uh, the Ramanuja, the delta function, which you get by evaluating this earlier series F, which I'm going to rewrite uh, at Q, right? It's, it's, it's a cusp form and it's the first cusp form of, um, it's a cusp form of smallest weight in level one. Yeah. So it's kind of the first time something appears, it's, uh, it's Perhaps interesting to study. So some of this uh, thing has been much studied. Of course, the delta function you can view it um, as a function on the modulized space of elliptic curves. That it is related to the discriminant of elliptic curves, and it's been studied since the 19th century. But Ramanujan kind of made some remarkable observations about the Fourier coefficients of this uh, delta function, right? And so, in, so it's called the Ramanujan delta function because of his deep study of it. Okay. So this Ramanujan delta function in terms of this Q and R, it's kind of a homogeneous polynomial of degree 12. If, if you remember that Q and R have weights four and six, and it is this, it's written this way. And it has the Q expansion, which we started with. And it has a Fourier expansion, which by definition is summation tau and QF. Right, so somehow this is the Ramanujan. Uh, and then Ramanujan in the, in the paper makes three conjectures or makes a few conjectures about these functions. He conjectures that the function is uh, multiplic multiplicative in the sense tau mn is equal to tau n and tau times tau n when m and n are co-prime integers. Then there's kind of a more complicated formula for tau p to the n plus one, it's tau p n times tau p times some correction term or whatever, minus p to the 11 times tau p to the n minus one. And then there, there, there's this kind of remarkable uh, observation that tau p is, the, is conjectured. He conjectured it's less than equal to two times p to the 11 by two. 5.5, the, yeah, the exponent is 5.5. And somehow Ramanujan was interested in these uh, kind of estimates to get a bound on the error terms in his representation of this convolved sum sigma RSN in terms of some two main terms and then error term, right? He wanted to bound the error term. So he, he had some bounds on the error term, but he wanted something as sharp as possible. And this kind of was what he thought was the... Okay, so in, for example, in Ramanujan's paper, uh, you can find a table for the first, uh, for tau of n for the first 30 values of n. Right, so somehow he kind of, okay, it grows fairly rapidly. And, uh, and on the basis of this, or perhaps he had probably computed more in his head on scratch paper, he made these conjectures, right? So, okay. Uh, so these conjectures turned out to be, have turned out to be pretty influential. Uh, okay, so for example, he has some, uh, some estimates uh, on this, uh, on these sort of ERS and N or equivalently the tau function for R plus S equal to 10. And uh, he gets some estimate that's roughly of order at most n to the seven. In fact, you can probably say n to the six. But uh, and he also he also kind of um, sort of wanted the best possible estimate, and he thought this was the best possible estimate, right? That uh, the exponent should be eleven by five point five. And uh, right, so this is uh, so you, this Ramanujan conjecture, which has become a sort of paradigm of it's, it's a general conjecture for automorphic forms, uh, was made first in this context. All right, so uh, the first two properties, which were the multiplicative properties of the tau function were pre proved pretty rapidly after, within a year or something of, after Ramanujan uh, conjectured them. And the way model, and then they were proved by model, uh, and he introduced operators, which later on got called Hecker operators. Hecker studied them further and deeply. 
he has introduced certain operators uh, on the space of modular forms that with commute with each other and can be diagonalized. Now these operators are kind of have some meaning uh, because these mod, mod, spaces of modular modular forms can be thought of as functions and lattices and etc. So you can look at some averaging function. So these operators, these Hecke operators, piece of elements of meaning, and uh, using this meaning, one can somehow prove for these operators the properties Ramanujan had conjectured for his tau function. Right, so these operators T sub n, I indexed by natural numbers n, have, have the same properties uh, which Ramanujan had conjectured for tau n. Right, so tau mn, T mn is equal to T m times T n for mn co prime, and this, and this kind of more complicated uh, thing for powers of T. Yeah, so he kind of, and then this was, this was amenable to prove because somehow these Hecke operators had some kind of group theoretic meaning. Okay. And uh, so the other property of this thing, this, so this is a space of operators, that is an algebra of operators acting upon this finite dimensional complex vector space, preserving the space of cusp forms. And, uh, and furthermore, if, uh, if, if you look at an eigenform for these Hecke operators, then first of all, the first Fourier coefficient is forced to be non-zero, otherwise the thing will be zero. And then you can normalize it to be one. And then there is a link between the eigenvalues of this, uh, for, of F acting upon TN and the Fourier coefficients. Right, f acting upon t, uh, tn acting upon f, uh, the eigenvalue turns out to be exactly the nth Fourier coefficient of f. Okay, and then these these uh, explicit modular forms of weight k and level one I wrote down are indeed Hecke eigenforms for tn with eigenvalues the Fourier coefficient sigma k. Right, and it turns out then that uh, that the delta function, which is now the uh, up to scaling the unique cusp form weight twelve, is an eigenform for these Hecke operators. And, uh, and as I said, uh, and, and it is a normalized form in the first Fourier coefficient is one, and it's an eigenform. So, uh, so, right, so, so delta Z, TL is equal to tau L delta Z, and TL, so TN satisfy the properties I'm going to just conjectured for tau, tau sub N, tau of N. And uh, so model deduced the first two conjectures of Ramanujan because the corresponding operators had that property, right? So if the operators have that property, then the eigenvalues will be forced to have the property. So that's how model proved uh, these first two conjectures of Ramanujan within a year or so of Ramanujan. yeah, pretty, pretty. So I guess so this is some kind of uh, we use some anachronistic term. I mean, this is some kind of cat idea of categorification where it's, rather than proving just properties of numbers, numbers if you don't have any structure, it's hard to prove anything about them. You kind of realize them as eigenvalues of operators, prove something for the operators, and hence deduce the same for the eigenvalues, right? So somehow we'll see this uh, sort of trying to conceptualize. At a, high, at a higher level, some of these things to get prove more properties of them, right? So some, that's kind of how the subject has gone. Okay, so now, the, for example, uh, in, in fact, in Ramanujan's paper, I don't know whether he writes down those properties in the way I've stated, uh, or he actually just considers this kind of, uh, the Dirichlet L series, or whatever, this, uh, this L delta S, some, which is the summation tau n n to the S, and he conjectures that this, uh, that this L delta S has an Euler product expansion of degree two, in the sense, L delta S is a product of uh, certain things, certain factors which are more elementary and which have to do with tau P. Right? So it's product of a prime P of this particular Euler factor, uh, which in some sense is thought of as an Euler factor of degree two. You can think of this as the polynomial one minus tau P X plus P to the 11 X squared evaluated at X equal to P to the minus S. Okay, so some of this is an Euler factor of degree two. And uh, okay, I'm gonna skip what Hecker did here. Uh, so in some sense, this was the first appearance in mathematics of a Euler of a L function with Euler factors of degree bigger than one. Right? Dirichlet in the 19th century had written down, had considered in his famous proof of the uh, primes in arithmetic progression, he had considered Dirichlet L series, which were L chi S, and they had Euler product expansions of degree one. Right? So Ram, the Ramanujan delta function, which again kind of showed up for Ramanujan in this kind of somewhat exotic way, as error terms of these convolved sums. Uh, turns out to be a L series, give rise to an L series with a Euler product expansion of degree two, right? And, and, that's, and, 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 and this Euler product expansion is equivalent, at least formally, to these two properties I wrote down for Ramanujan's. Uh... Yeah, any questions? I don't know. Okay. okay, so now the third property actually turned out, to, uh, turned out to take some proving and it was not proven for at least for maybe six decades after he first, uh, after he first uh, conjectured it. So the almost, I mean, if you just try, try to get the bound to be P to the six rather than P to the 5.5, then it's rather easy to prove. You can prove it as a consequence of the maximum modulus principle. And uh, uh, so if, for example, I mean, this conjecture, one would, uh, one would wonder what is the importance of it? Hardy was skeptical about the importance of the sharpening. And he said, we seem to have drifted into one of the backwaters of mathematics, uh, but he qualified this by saying that the problem 
might have some interest uh, because Ramanujan had identified it as an interesting thing. And uh, on the other hand, the conjecture and its natural generalizations have turned, out, turned into one of the central problems in the theory of automorphic form. Right? So Ramanujan was pretty prophetic in terms of latching on, uh, thinking about this property or concentrating on this property. Right? And uh, the, the, the kind of context in which it arose, maybe now, I, I don't know, at least certainly I've never thought about these convulsions. I don't know how, many, how much people study these convulsions these days, right? but uh, it arose in this context. Uh, but on the other hand, the importance of the conjecture is kind of has been much larger than the original context in which Ramanujan uh, looked at this. All right, and the other thing which, uh, the, okay, so this was some, some, some stuff about uh, multiplicative properties and Archimedean size of tau n. Ramanujan also discovered a remarkable congruence for tau n, which has been kind of again, very influential in, in various developments in number theory, which is that tau n, though tau n is itself as a function has no simple formula, right? It's kind of some kind of mysterious function, but sometimes modulo primes, he discovered that mod 691, which is a fairly large prime, uh, it, it, it is very simple, right? It's, it's congruent to this kind of simple arithmetical function, sigma 11n, which is just a sum of divisors of n to the 11th power. And somehow the 691 has something to do with the fact that 691 divides the numerator of the 12th Bernoulli number, which happens to be the constant term of the Eisenstein series of weight 12, right? So, so there's some reason why 691 appears here. Okay, so this was the, now this congruence also practicing in some sense directly played a role in the developments which led to Sayer formulating his conjecture. So, uh, so okay, after Ramnujan, several people, English and Indian mathematicians, kind of wrote down similar congruences for primes 2, 3, 5, 7, 23, 6, 91. So, six of these primes, sometimes the high powers of these primes, not just so, for example, 2, their congruence is mod 2 to the 11, etc. Right, and the feature of these congruences is that uh, these are always something like tau n is congruent to something related to the sum divisor function, sums of divisors functions, but not exactly, sometimes there's some. Okay, so now the, now the question is, I think maybe the, so Sunit and I and Sir they decided to try to understand why are there these congruences and why are there no other congruences people have discovered modulo other primes, right? So there were these six primes, which are called exceptional primes for the Ramanujan delta function, for which there were nice, there were sort of congruences for tau n. So tau of L was equal to L to the A plus L to the B or something for some fixed A and B, mod, mod those primes. But uh, but uh, no, so only for these primes, right? So then, uh, so the explanation for these uh, congruences given by given by given in the nineteen sixties and the Ramanujan bound, right? So the proof of all these are kind of arose. Uh, the answer lay in the Galois representations associated to the delta function. Okay, so uh, so Sayer in this kind of, kind of seminar, the launch uh, piece of Porto in 1967-68, conjectured uh, that there should exist an Eladic Galois representation, right, in GL2 of the Eladic numbers, which are some sort of putting together of Z model to the R for various Rs, right? So he conjectured that the Eladic representation associated to the uh, delta function of the absolute Galois group of Q, so the Galois group of Q bar over Q. And uh, and the tie with the and, the and the the link with the delta function is that this representation uh, is unramified outside L, which is to say somehow that the fixed field of the kernel of this representation is made up of number fields with discriminants which have only powers of L in them. And uh, the, once once some representation is unramified at a prime p, somehow locally at that prime p, this representation becomes rather simple. You just need to know what happens to the Frobenius at p. There's some kind of marked conjugacy class. And uh, so then the tau function appears in the characteristic polynomial of this Eladic representation uh, evaluated at this Frobenius at p. Right? So if you look at the characteristic polynomial of rho delta L at frob p, then it has this particular form, x squared minus. So the trace of this Galois representation at p, at Frobenius at p is tau p, and its determinant is p to the 11. Right? And 11 is somehow 12, 12 minus 1, which is the weight of the delta function. Okay, so the, in fact, again, so Sayer conjectured this in 1967 or something, and then within a year or so, Delin actually proved these, uh, proved these representations existed. Of course, Sayer was not plucking this out of thin air because uh, such representations were, also, were known to be associated to new forms of weight two. Uh, okay, maybe there's a typo here, K equal to two, it should say. And Level N had been constructed by Eichler Shimura in the 1950s. Uh, but that, that, for that, they had the crutch of abelian varieties available. So somehow it's a, more, it's a simpler construction, but it was known since the 1950s that you have such Galois representations associated to Hecke eigenforms. Right? So the novelty of Sayer's uh, conjecture or the thing he was considering was that the weight was higher than two, it was 12. 
And there was also work of Kuga Shimura, which was kind of uh, certainly related to this. Okay. Okay, so now, uh, now, the, now up the categorification ladder, now that numbers tau p have acquired a more sophisticated meaning as traces of Frobenius in some Galois representation. Right? And then somehow uh, uh, Dalin proved this conjecture and realized these representations geometrically. And then later on, after six, seven years, nine, I, I, perhaps in 1974, he proved the way conjectures, right? So he, which, which gave bounds on traces of Frobenia acting upon some kind of cohomology groups. And as a, as a result, he deduced this bound, right? So it was a very, very elaborate proof. Uh, and it took 60 years, right? And it, it, it required development of ethyl cohomology and construction of Gal the map from modular forms to Galois representations and realizing these Galois representations in some geometric way to prove this conjecture, right? It took some proving. Okay. Recently, in fact, there's been some development where you get a proof which is not geometric in nature in this sort of 10 author paper, but okay, but uh, still, I mean, uh, still takes some proving. Yeah. Okay. So now the other thing that I, what I want to focus on in the remaining half an hour is, uh, is, uh, yeah, is, is this congruence mod 691 and how it led to Sayers conjecture. So, right, so the, uh, the congruence mod 691 is equivalent to the fact that if you look, look at this 691 addict representation associated to, uh, right, so if I look, oh, sorry, look at L equal to 691 in this, in this L addict representation. Yeah, look at it. So you look at this uh, into GL2 Z mod 6, Z691, and you can reduce it mod 691. Right? Then you, can, you get a mod 691 representation. And the congruence of Ramanujan, which is uh, this tau and congruent to sigma 11 and mod 691, can be uh, re expressed Galois theoretically as saying that if you look at this Galois representation mod 691, it degenerates in the sense it has a smaller image than perhaps all of GL2. And uh, so it's an upper triangular representation. And on the diagonal, you have the trivial character. And the uh, mod 691 cyclotomic character, which observes the action of Galois on 691st roots of unity to the 11th power. Right? So it has this particular shape. So there somehow it becomes reducible. The Galois representation, which one, which generically is irreducible, as it turns out, turns out in this case to be reducible, which, which accounts for some of these congru this congruence. Okay, and this again played a big role in the work of Ribbit in the 1970s on things to do with class numbers of cyclotomic fields. Okay, so now uh, Sarah and Sunil proved that, uh, proved that, in fact, even before I think Delim proved these representations existed, they axiomatically just assumed these representations existed with the given properties, which said, which told you what the traces of these representations were at Frobenia elements. And they kind of started a deep analysis of what the image of such a Galois representation can be, is. So they proved that, uh, that this Eladic representation has big image, so it contains SL2ZL, the Elad of the L2. Right. The SL2ZL for L different from these exceptional primes. And in general, it has pretty large image, right? It has open image in GL2ZL for all L, or at least, yeah. Where did the exceptional primes come? Yeah, so these are some of these exceptional primes. Two, three, five, seven are there just because they're small and they're less than the weight. 23 is some kind of an eccentric prime, but it has, yeah, I don't know. It has something to do with, again, maybe it can be explained with the with respect to something called Ramanujan's theta operator. And 691 is because it divides the 12th Bernoulli number. You may have to have. But yeah, these small primes always kind of uh, occur maybe, but uh, 23 and 691 are somewhat sporadic primes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna scan and okay. Okay, well, that's, so if there's, if there's any students in the audience, uh, kind of they, uh, as part of the analysis, they proved the simple group theory lemma that if you have a close subgroup of GL to ZL, that mod L contains uh, SL2FL, then original, then the Eladic thing contains SL2CL, right? Some sort of Nakayama's lemma in this situation. All right. So, uh, so, they, so in, in the context of, in, in the context in which they were, I mean, they are, Swinnerton and I, I think, observed the following congruence also, which plays a role in the story. So you can look at this uh, delta function, right? It has this Q expansion. And then you now you read it mod 11, just formally, right? Without worrying, maybe you just read it formally in terms of, so now you can use Fermat's little theorem or whatever the, the high school version of the binomial theorem to factor 22, 22S2 to the 11 and take 11 inside, right? So you get, uh, you get this, this particular Q, Q product expansion and that turns out to be related to a cusp form of weight two and weight two and level 11, right? So the delta function mod 11, so the delta is a weight 12, but mod 11, it looks like a, cusp form of weight two on a slightly higher, less, smaller subgroup, right? And this is the L equal to case of, uh, of a general uh, sort of uh, thing, Sayer proved. 
that you can sometimes reduce the weight at the expense of increasing the level. Right? So all these kind of themes play a big role in uh, says conjectures and so on. I mean, because the some of the concept of a modular form becomes malleable mod 11, sorry, mod L, kind of it, there are many congruences and the congruences play a big role in, in the theory. Okay, so for example, what did uh, Sayer and Sundar exactly prove? So the, they, they proved that this re LRIC representation is an irreducible representation and it's odd in the sense when you evaluate it at the, at, a, at, the com at the conjugacy class of complex conjugation, then the, it gets ma mapped to one zero zero minus one and not a scalar. They also proved for L outside this exceptional set, or in fact, okay, uh, the reduction is absolutely irreducible, which is a stronger statement than the elliptic thing being irreducible. For L equal to 23, it has some exceptional behavior, which I'm going to skip. And the determinant of uh, rho delta L is the 11th power of the elliptic cyclotomic character, which, uh, which give, kind of gives you the action of GQ or the absolute Galois group of Q on the L power roots of unity. And for L not equal to these exceptional primes, the image is not only irreducible, but is large, right? It's non-solvable. It contains SL2 FL. Okay, so this kind of, this, this, uh, this they, they did as a result of some rather beautiful and deep study of congruences between modular forms, right? So uh, this is work of Sayer and Sunil and Dyer, which was first reported on, I think, by Sayer in a seminar Burbaki talk, maybe in 1972 or 73. And then I think also Sunil and Dyer wrote some article in one of the Antwerp proceedings. Okay. All right, and somehow uh, once you show that some of these uh, L mod L images are large, in particular non-solvable for outside this exceptional set, then uh, one can then somehow say that there can't, there cannot be some simple-minded congruences for tau and mod L, right? So you, I'm going to skip this again. Again, you can just under, you can uh, once you know this, uh, what the images of these Galois representations are, you can rule out there being uh, simple congruences for the tau function modulo any prime L outside this exceptional set, right? So the congruence on P does not determine any congruence on tau P out in, in outside this exceptional set of primes. All right. So this is what Sarah and Sonin had, had done. Now let me. So this was uh, so this was the forward direction where you go from a modular form to a Galois representation. Sayer's conjecture is interested is the statement in the opposite direction. So it's kind of a reciprocity statement. Though Sayer doesn't like like it to be called reciprocity. But anyway. So so if we denote by k delta L the extension of Q through which uh, rho bar delta L factors. Right, then this extension has the following properties. So, so now we are looking at the delta function. We are looking at, it, uh, looking at, looking at its model representation coming via some fancy construction of Dedin. Uh, of course, mod L somehow, it, the construction is easier because somehow you can also realize these representations as coming from abelian varieties. Uh, and this, this the extension cut out by rho, rho bar delta L has the following properties. It's, un, it's a finite, it's a number field. It's unramified outside L in infinity. Uh, the Galois group of this extension embeds inside GL to FL. If uh, L is outside this exceptional set, then the image of this Gal then the Galois group contains SL to FL. Under this embedding of the Galois group into GL to FL, the determinant of the matrix is minus one of complex conjugation. And okay, so somehow this is telling you something about this representation in terms of its the Galois group and its local ramification properties, right? It's unramified outside L and infinity. But somehow now to tie it to the delta function, you need to you need, you need more information. And somehow you need to know what's happening for this extension at L. What's what are the ramification properties of this extension at L? So uh, so somehow, I mean, the property, the ramification property is that uh, under this uh, embedding of the Galois group into GL to FL, the inertia group at L gets mapped into one of two possibilities, right? It's either up to semi-simplification. So it's up to, it's either one, the identity plus the 11th power of the model cyclotomic character, or it has some different behavior, which I'm not going to go into because that happens very rarely, as we'll see. Okay, so it's nice that then it becomes in, in the second situation, the local representation at L is irreducible and on inertia, it has this shape. Okay, so in fact, the, these two, these, this, this dichotomy, uh, this, this kind of, these two, uh, these two cases are related to the property of tau L mod L. The first case occurs whenever tau L is prime to L and the second case occurs when the local representation is irreducible, uh, when L divides tau L, right? And somehow when this, I think, for example, when Ser wrote his, uh, wrote his uh, wrote the, this seminar in 1967 perhaps the only values he knew when tavel is common into zero model or perhaps two three five seven or maybe he also knew two two four one one i don't know but later on in the 19 few years ago i don't know exactly but someone found this frightening frighteningly large value for which tavel is common into zero model right seven billion and something 
So, but still, though, though this either, though this phenomenon of tau L being super singular at L, which is this tau L congruent to zero model, is widely expected to be very rare. But still, one does not know that the the contrary case, which is called ordinarity, one does not know tau L is ordinary at L for infinitely many L. Right. So it's kind of some mysterious thing where, though you expect it to have, be, happen overwhelmingly often, you don't even know it happens infinitely often. Okay, so uh, somehow it's okay. So these are the properties of this uh, field extension. So now we are converting a modular form into a into a field extension, right? Indexed by the primes L, and the field extension somehow has something to do with Galois groups like GL two FL, and they're unramified outside L in infinity, and they have some more detailed behavior at L, some ramification behavior which is captured by the weight of the modular form related to the weight of the modular. Okay, any questions? All right, so now the rough version of says modularity conjecture, at least for the delta function, things arise, supposed to be arising from the delta function would ask that any such extension, the, right, suppose you look at an abstract extension of Q with Galois group, something roughly like GL to FL, and it is unramified outside L in infinity, it's odd at infinity in the sense the image of complex conjugation is not scalar in the Galois group. Uh, and some of the inertial behavior looks like it comes from weight 12, which is to say it has one of these two behaviors, right? So somehow, it's a more constrained kind. Then one would ask, then, then one, one could ask, is such an extension equal to k delta L? Right? So somehow it's a converse question. How can you characterize which extensions uh, with certain properties come from the delta function? Right? So, the, so this was, the first, in some sense, the first case we proved uh, in, in roughly 2004 uh, in, in, in work with Jean-Pierre uh, Valtombeger. And yeah, it was one of the... So if we had... I've, okay, so I'll come, come back to this. So if we drop five, right, in the sense, if you don't really try to specify what the ramification at L is doing, then the rough formula conjecture would say that any such extension comes from a, some new form of level one without knowing the weight, right? And, and, and if we further drop the condition of being unramified outside L, then, one, then the conjecture predicts that any GL2 FL type of extension right, or FL bar extension, uh, which, is un, yeah, which is odd and yeah, uh, with certain properties comes from some modular form. Right, so somehow this uh, delta thing is just a very special case of the conjecture, but uh, okay, so it's one of the first cases we proved. So example for L, L equal to 11 is uh, the conjecture predicts if you have an irreducible odd representation, unramified outside level, uh, outside 11 and satisfying the condition on inertia at 11, right, which would be, in this case, it would be something like inertia goes to the mod, mod 11 cyclotomic character star 01, for example. Then says conjecture and this congruence I recalled above of says of Sunat and Dyer between delta and S2 gamma naught 11 would predict that rho arises from the 11 torsion of the, of the ellipt of, there's no, of, of one of the two elliptic curves over Q of smallest conductor, namely 11, right? So somehow this is the, again, an embodying of some abstract representation. It's just some abstract Galois theoretic object as long as it has some properties which are purely local in nature. Then one kind of tries to embody it, tries to re realize it from a much more concrete source, like a modular form or an elliptic curve. Right? So somehow that's the nature of the conjecture. All right. So more formally stated, says conjecture is about two-dimensional representations of the absolute Galois group of Q into two by two matrices invertible over a finite field. But he knows who has written it. Sorry. Mahane. So and it says that if you have a if you have a representation which is uh, odd in the sense that the image of complex conjugation is not a scalar. Or rather, at least, um, or to be more precise, one should say the determinant of Im uh, com image of complex conjugation should be minus one because for L equal to two, there's some extent. Yeah. Uh, then it should arise from a new form, right? So, so, the, so, the, so this is the conjecture. So, any so it, uh, it characterizes two-dimensional representations which come from new forms, right? So representations which come from new forms certainly have this oddness property. They are typically irreducible. So, says says conjecture the converse to this to this thing. Okay, so so this was the conjecture, right? Any questions? So, of course, if you see seen for the first time, this is one has to stare at it a little bit. So, it's a two-dimensional representation of the absolute Galois group of Q. It's always going to have some finite image, though the field might be FL bar. Uh, that's the notion of continuity. And it's going to factor through some finite Galois extension of Q, and uh, it's irreducible. Okay, absolutely irreducible, and it's odd, which is to say, it's in the determinant of complex conjugation is minus one. So, then this oddness is related to the fact that the Modular forms in level one, for example, vanish for weights which are odd. Okay, and uh, yeah, such a representation comes from a new form. Okay, so this was the conjecture. 
And uh, he, in fact, made a precise, more precise conjecture. So, as, as I say, so he first made this conjecture in a letter to Tate in 1973, and then published a small note about it in 1975. But then, uh, stimulated by a kind of Fry's brilliant idea about kind of deducing Fermat's last theorem from these type of conjectures, he kind of made these invariants from which uh, the Galois representation arises more precise, right? So he he defined the level n row, which somehow was some off-the-shelf definition using the notion of a conductor, which existed before he did this. On the other hand, he made a very artisanal definition of the weight, which has been very influential in uh, the Mod P. Langlands program. Right? So somehow this the, the Duke paper, one of the main uh, one of the main innovations or the, one of the main developments is to define the weight precisely, right? It, it takes seven, eight pages. It's purely by hand, right? But somehow it's a rather intricate definition. And so that it's consistent with various things he and Tate and various people had proved about modular forms. Okay. Okay, so and somehow this refinement of the Serre ser, ser made of his conjecture from 1975 to 1987 was, as I said, stimulated by uh, Fry's observation relating Fermat's last theorem to modularity of Galois representations. Okay, so now remarkably Tate in, uh, by return post, right, when, when Serre wrote to Tate in 1973, within a month or so, or he replied by proving his conjecture for L equal to 2. And that the argument he used was extremely elementary but beautiful, kind of using only basic algebraic number theory. Somehow the argument was that uh, you get upper and lower bounds and fields cut out by these uh, representations, right? And somehow the upper bounds come from the arguments to do with ramification and lower bounds come from Minkowski's estimates on, um, on discriminants of number fields. And then somehow he showed that for mod 2, if you have a representation of GQ into GL2 F2 bar, which is unramified outside 2, right? And which is, uh, then, it is then it is forced to factor through Q zeta 8. Right, or something he made some very explicit kind of thing, and the, and the, and the, the entire argument pin, uh, sort of uh, relies on the numerical fact that two to the five by five by two is less than pi e squared upon four. Right, so somehow it, 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 it relied on it's quite pretty close, it's 5.65 is less than 5.8. Uh, so, uh, Serre Ser observed that if you, you can use state's argument for l equal to three using slightly better and bounds on Odlitsko or uh -huh. on discriminants due to Odlitsko for l equal to five, uh, Sharon Brueggemann later uh, kind of proved similar statements, but after a while this, uh, this argument just doesn't work, right? For L equal to 7, for example, there's no way this kind of argument can work. And nonetheless, these initial cases proved by Tate were a starting point for our proof of size conjecture. Well, our, our proof of size conjecture uses an induction on the prime 11, uh, L, and the initial cases are supplied by Tate's very nice and very elementary proof, which has nothing to do with modular forms, right? It's just a purely algebraic number theory. So one needs accidents, one needs to be lucky somewhere to be able to, yeah, so this is the piece of luck. Okay, so Fermat, so what is the connection of Fermat's last theorem and Serre's conjecture? Okay, so uh, so the so suppose you start with a counter example to Fermat's last theorem. So suppose you have a to the p plus b to the, yeah, plus c to the p equal to zero for p a prime bigger than, let's say, seven. Uh, then what Fry or kind of Fry looked at the elliptic curve, okay, I didn't write down the elliptic, you look at the elliptic curve y squared equal to x to the x minus a to the p into x plus b to the p, right? And you write down some elliptic curve coming from this uh, triple of solutions, and you observe that the mod p representation arising from this elliptic curve has some exceptional properties, right? He showed, for example, uh, or rather said, okay, so he thought that this representation should be too, ex I mean, should not exist, right? But so Serre made precise the reason why it should not exist. So Serre showed, for example, he kind of looked at this as Fry's thing and the, looked at the mod P representation and did a ramification analysis of this, of this mod P representation and showed that the row, that the invariants, invariants associated this mod P representation were, 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 were two, right? K rho is equal to two, the weight is two and the level is two, right? So the Serre's conjecture would predict that rho arises from S2 gamma zero two, right? Which is some of the space of holomorphic differentials on some P1, which is zero. And therefore that's a contradiction. Right, so somehow that was uh, that was how uh, Serre formalized uh, Fry's intuition that somehow the pri elliptic curve, which is an elliptic curve I should have written, okay, I could write it, but uh, uh, should not exist. The, 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 the non-existence was related to, maybe I should write it, yeah. Maybe the non-existence was related to, uh, the elliptic curve could well exist, but the mod P representation somehow had too small ramification, right? So somehow this was the curve. You normalize, if you normalize these numbers correctly, Okay, so this elliptic curve certainly exists if, you, if ABC exists, but then the mod P representation has the ramification properties which are contradictory to Serre's conjecture. Okay, so somehow this is part of this kind of 
Minkowski hermit, Minkowski philosophy that uh, objects with limited ramification kind of a struggle to exist. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, on the other hand, uh, okay, as I said, okay, so says conjecture is some sort of vast kind of conjecture, but Ribbit, Ribbit had pro proven the proved enough of says conjectures, uh, or he had shown that uh, this this consequence to a Fermat's last theorem following would follow just from the, not just, but from the modularity of elliptic curves of Q, right? And then this was proved by Wiles, of course, famously in 1994, and hence you got a proof of Fermat's last theorem, okay? So, uh, okay, in fact, so just to kind of give you some context of how we, uh, how our work kind of, uh, one of the one of the strategies of our, one of the steps of our proof of Stiles conjecture was that, okay, so about, uh, what, what we, uh, somehow we can uh, give a rearranged proof of Stiles conjecture of uh, Fermat's last theorem, uh, using our methods. So our proof uh, was the following. You, you so look at this mod P representation, uh, which Fry constructs, right? Which comes from this elliptic I wrote down there. And on the other hand, it has very limited ramification, right? So you start with a elliptic which has a large conductor. It'll be the radical of ABC. On the other hand, mod P, the, the mod P representation, the conductor is degenerated, right? From AB, from whatever, some very large thing to two. On the other hand, so one would uh, then try, one, one could try and say that somehow though this, this mod P representation should arise from a geometric object like an abelian variety, which reflects the ramification behavior of this mod P representation. Right? So one would try to show that this, uh, one, one could try to show that this mod P representation coming from the Fry elliptic curve, in fact, comes from maybe another abelian variety, maybe of higher dimension, but uh, that has good reduction outside two and semi-stable reduction at two. Right? So somehow you try to make the representation, the mod P representation come from, an ab from a geometric object which has the same ramification properties as the residual representation. Right? So somehow I've, I've, I've proof of size conjecture, one of the key steps is to prove such statements. And on the other hand, uh, people had shown, Fontaine had shown that such an abelian variety did not exist. Right? So somehow this was a different way of uh, proving, uh, of, of presenting the proof of uh, Fermat's last theorem. Of course, it looks different and it doesn't directly use modular forms, but the entire proof really depends upon why this is a breakthrough work on, on modular ellipticals, but yeah. The rearranged proof, and some of this was a key step in our proof of size conjecture. This kind of lifting statement. Okay, and in fact, uh, when, when, when we first proved size conjecture, uh, we uh, somehow showed some initial cases, and the, the, in those in, initial cases, for example, for primes equal to two, three, five, seven in level one, which is to say representations unramified outside L, outside these primes, the representation is not supposed to exist. But the first time such a representation exists. Conjecturally, it was for the prime L equal to 11. And uh, because the delta function somehow gives rise to a mod 11 representation, which actually is irreducible and satisfies all these properties. And again, our proof used a coarse striking result, which is a generalization of Fontaine Abrushkin, that, uh, or a development of that, that all abelian varieties over Q with good reduction outside 11 and semi stable reduction at 11 are isogenous to products of X naught 11. So there are two elliptic curves of conductor 11 over Q, up to isomorphism. One is X not 11 and one is X 1 11, right? But anyway, up to isogeny, there's one. And um, yeah. All right, so, so in some sense, okay, so now let me come to the last, how much time do I have? Okay, in the last six minutes, let, let me come to, uh, let me come to uh, this thing of this book of Bas Edix Hohen. Okay, so uh, this, uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this book of Edix Hohen, uh, which is called Computational Aspects of Modular Forms and Galois Representations, uh, but they, they set themselves the task of computing tau p, right? Coming, coming with an algorithm, algorithm to compute tau p in polynomial time in log p. Right? So some of their task was to come up with a, at least theoretically efficient algorithm to compute tau p. Okay, so the main result of this book is uh, for a prime p, the Ramanujan's function tau p can be computed in time polynomial in log p. Right, so some of this is uh, the, the, this, the, the entire, the, the basic method of this, uh, book is based on Scope's algorithm. Scope, uh, I, don't know, I think in the 1980s, I don't know exactly, uh, he had given an algorithm to compute. So suppose you, give, you, suppose you have an elliptic curve of, uh, over a finite field P or FP. Let's right, so suppose you look at an elliptic curve E or FP elliptic curve. But you want to you want to you want to count. I suppose you suppose you want to count, and this is for various practical reasons. Apparently, uh, it's important to find uh, important to find efficient algorithms to count the number of points of this elliptic. Right? You want to count the cardinality of e of fp. Right? So suppose you have some curve like y squared equal to x cubed plus ax plus b or something. You want to find right. There's a point at infinity, but then you want to find the 
solutions of this equation with y, x and y and fp. So of course, one naive thing would be to plug in various values of x, right? And then for find whether there exists a square root or not. But that will obviously take at least time, which is linear in p and therefore not uh, polynomial in log p, right? So the naive method certainly doesn't give you a efficient algorithm, but, uh, uh, but Scove remarkably found that you can kind of use the action of Frobenius of p and the et al cohomology uh, model of this, of this elliptic curve. And that is a better way of computing these points, right? So somehow there was a procedure to, uh, to there was a procedure to have, the, or there was an algorithm to compute points of elliptic curves or be, of elliptic curves using the theory of Galois representation, right? So, uh, no, the number of points, number of points. So the idea, Scope's idea, was to do it this mod L of several of several primes L. Use the fact that yeah, that the that the yeah, and there's p plus one minus a p. So you just need to know a and a p is less than or equal to root p. So you just need to do it do it for sufficiently many primes L. And for prime mod, a p mod L, you can compute using the Frobenius acting on L torsion. Right? But anyway, it seems fantastic that this very elaborate procedure kind of produces your workable algorithm. But anyway, so uh, but the point was that this was some kind of uh, elliptic curve kind of thing. He was Bass and his co author wanted to generalize this to motives of kind of higher, of kind of higher dimension or varieties like uh, th the things coming from delta function. Right. So, uh, so on the other hand, so if you just try to, for example, if you just try to use the definition of tau and that, uh, if you just multiply out this Q expansion or Q, whatever, Q product, Q product expansion, uh, somehow you won't get a good algorithm, right? Because then to compute tau and you need to compute all the tau m's for m less than n. Right? And so somehow it'll be. It won't be polynomial in log of p order, right? So, in, and in general, the philosophy of this book was that we we hope that uh, for example, okay, here's, here's this quote: we hope that non-solvable global extension whose existence and local properties are implied by the Langlands program can be made accessible to computation and so become even more useful members of the society of mathematical objects. Explicit description of these fields, these fields in the sense those arising from the delta function, for example, make the study of global properties such as class groups and groups of units possible. Certainly, if, you only, if we only knew the maximal abelian extension of Q as described by general class field theory, then roots of unity would be very much welcome. Right? So, so in, in the sense that you, you can have some abstract theorem which tells you some parameterization of abelian extension of a number field, but over Q, for example, you have a much more explicit statement that all of them come from six cyclotomic fields. Right? So somehow uh, one wants to do the same for GL2 type extensions of Q. Okay. So in some sense, Sayers conjecture gives you an answer for explicit class of some sort of way. Explicit class field theory or explicit generation of GL2 finite field valued extensions of Q, which are odd. Okay, okay so uh, okay, in the last two minutes, let, let me tell you. So yeah, uh, uh, the, uh, the one of the tasks, one of the tasks in this book is to compute this role, this K delta L, right? The splitting field of these uh, delta func the Galois representation coming from delta mod L. Right? So this is done in chapter seven of the book, and. Uh, so there, so it's for, for this kind of, so the other, so in the next, okay, let me write down this table, okay, it's not very visible, but uh, the, in that book, they write down these val these polynomials, PKL, uh, so for example, we have, in, for the delta function, you have to look at the first three cases, so the weight K is 12, I don't know whether this is visible, okay, the way, the weight is 12, and the, the primes are, it could have been 11, but okay, uh, the primes are 13, 17, and 19. Right, so for example, in each case, the value of the degree of the polynomial is L plus one, so 14, 18, and 20, and the coefficients are fairly large, right? And so somehow they write down these polynomials and they make the assertion that the splitting field of these polynomials exactly give you K delta L, or maybe the projectivized version of K, the K delta L fixed by the center. Okay, so uh, for this, uh, somehow, I mean, so, so they wrote down this polynomial, right? So to write down this polynomial, there was a lot of work. They used a lot of mathematics, oracle of theory, this, that. And they also used the fact that delta model actually is congruent to a weight two form. Right? So somehow then you have the clutch of a billion varieties available. And uh, they do a lot of work to write down these polynomials, right? But on the other hand, the, the, these polynomials are written down by using some sort of approximation cutoff arguments. And one is not sure in the end that they, they do actually what they're supposed to do. Right, so, so they write down candidate polynomials, which should work. And what they can prove about these polynomials is that the splitting field of these extensions of these polynomials is the Galois group is PGL2 of FL. That, this, uh, that the extension you're getting, right, which is uh, the splitting field of this polynomial is unramified outside L and is not totally real. And so, and, and the third, last thing they get is that they get some estimate on the discriminant of this extension. They can show you that they can tell you that the exponent at L of the discriminant is L plus 10. Right, so somehow they can only study local properties of this Galois representations besides the first global property, which is the Galois group being large. 
On the other hand, then one wants to tie this to the delta function, right? Because theoretically, one wants, though they are pretty sure at this point that this should be k delta L or the or that k delta L fixed by the center. They are not sure. They could, they can't be absolutely theoretically sure of it. Though practically, it's pretty right. But for that, they use Sayers conjecture. In fact, so they prove this for this lemma or corollary. It's corollary three in that book in that chapter. So so suppose you have a projective representation, right? And suppose and then and uh, and then you look at the uh, corresponding splitting field of this Galois representation and the look at the fixed field, look at the field fixed by the Borel subgroup, right? So you'll get typically a, some extension of degree L plus one. Now, if the valuation of the discriminant of the extension has this property, then the Sayer weight, right, is turns out to be K. So in this case, uh, or it's supposed to come from a weight K modular form. So if the discriminant has the form L, where L is the residue prime plus K minus two, then we suspect, or then, then they prove that the weight is, then the, the expected weight of the modular form is K. Okay, so now so now one applies this to this uh, these polynomials they construct. They, they can prove that the discriminant is L plus 10. In this case, 10 is 12 minus K is 12 because it's K minus 2 is 10. Okay, so uh, so now using this, so essentially, so, so but the, the problem at this point is that they can only verify ramification properties of the splitting field of their polynomials, but they cannot directly tie it to the delta function. But on the other hand, they check these local properties. And then now, if you know Sayers conjecture, then you they, then Sayers conjecture will tell you that such an extension does come from delta, right? Because there's a unique cusp form of weight 12, which is the delta function. And, and the corollary is telling you that the thing comes from something. Corollary plus Sayers conjecture tells you it comes from the space of modular forms of weight 12. And there's only one, which is the delta function. Right? So this is a curious application of Sayers conjecture. Sayers conjecture is about going backwards from Galois representations of modular forms. Here you're starting with the modular form. But, but to actually prove that the algorithm which is written down in the book actually does what it says it does, you really need to use size conjecture. At least it seemed to be at that time. Okay. Uh, all right. Maybe I'll stop here. I, I had, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you, Are there any questions? So you said there's a new proof of uh, Deline's work in this 10 author paper, which is uh, independent. Yeah, I think it follows Langland's original kind of strategy of trying to prove properties of symmetric powers and get, get better and better powers. Once you know automorphy of more and more symmetric powers, you can get somehow squeeze the size of the eigenvalues of Frobenius more and more. Yeah, some, some proof in that style. So it's a genuinely new proof. Yeah, because in that case, I think there uh, you're in a situation where with a modular form which has no direct connection to geometry. So I there is no etal cohomology to see, see. rely upon, I think. And uh, yeah, so you're forced to, you, you don't have the scratch. And, uh, I see. Yeah. So for example, if you look at a Bianchi form, so a modular, modular form of right. GL2 of an imaginary quadratic field. Yes. The corresponding geometric object is a hyperbolic, it's a threefold, so no, yes. can't be an algebraic variety. Yes. So there is no ethyl cohomology. Right, right. But right. this there is more automorphic proof. I see. Yeah. Any it's other questions? The delta function before. Ah, there's some question on YouTube. Can you speak a little louder, please? Uh, if Ramanujan knew the delta function before, history of delta functions which existed before, in geometrically. Did Ramanujan name the delta function? Knew the delta function. Did you what did? Who named the delta function? The delta function has existed uh, before, before Ramanujan, but I think he made a deep study of it. I mean, these functions now. In, now sorry. Ah, oh, that I, I don't know. I mean, Ramanujan doesn't, I mean, he does talk about these functions Q and R, and he calls, I think he calls them elliptic functions. Uh, I mean, that's what they have sort of functions on space of elliptic curves, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, he doesn't really, I mean, the proof is the, the paper is not written in the form of lemma, proof, proposition, proof. There's a, there's a stream of calculations and uh, there are various functions P and Q and R introduced. In fact, the, I actually, I, I, I want to go back to the paper because in some sense, this convolved sum is equal to sigma R plus S plus one and there's sigma R plus S minus one. Right, so somehow there's ice, and, and there's also, I think it's related to his, uh, there's a famous operator called the Ramanujan theta operator called QD by DQ. And uh, some of this, the fact that there, there are two terms here is related to the fact that you're applying the theta operator to some isosensory. Yeah, so there are some very various, uh, so in fact, I, 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 I was uh, say, I mean, I was, I mean, the question is whether, say, whether Ramanujan thought in terms of modular forms, right? So say kind of uh, said that. It, it didn't matter, right? Because to Ramanujan was not important whether he 
new modular forms or not. He knew enough for, 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 what, for what he wanted to do. And uh, somehow the fact that the delta function has this Euler product expansion, which somehow seems to be of degree two, Sayer suggested that means somehow he was aware of the connection with GL2 and modular forms. But yeah, I don't I, I have not first of all, I have not made a deep study of this paper, but uh, I've, I've looked at it a few times. But then, uh, yeah, he may have, I don't know what his pre knowledge was before this paper. Any further thoughts or questions? Yes. Uh, I mean, I probably built this in the book. So you had mentioned about this lightness and which is a tau n is not equal to. So what is the notion of density? Is there a density density or the density in the factor? I think you can yeah, use the weakest notion you want, but still it would be. But no, the lemma conjecture is tau n is not equal to zero for all n. The lemma, lemma conjecture is known for density one, I think. Tau p is not equal to zero for for a density one set of primes is known. Yeah. I don't know, but I think you can probably take any notion of density one. For example, Dirichlet density, yeah. But I think the more subtle, the, the harder the question of whether tau p is not going to zero mod p, that's kind of totally unknown. I think. The tau p not equal to zero is supposed to happen for, for all times p, tau p is supposed to be not zero, right, by lemma. And that is known up to density, uh, up to error term of density zero. Whatever notion of density I think you want, yeah. But, uh, but the, the subtler question of whether tau p is congruent to zero mod p or not, or the sub question that tau p is not congruent to zero mod p for infinitely for density one perhaps prime p that is totally unknown it's not even known as for whether this should have whether this happens for infinitely many primes p though as you say it's as you see it's exceedingly rare up to 10 billion there are only five or six values for which it is yeah. i think i looked up the wikipedia entry once about how they how people found this prime seven billion right, right. yeah but i've forgotten what the story was do you, do you, do you know what going to ask. Yeah, 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 yeah i don't know how people find such frighteningly large primes any further thoughts? If not, let's thank Shaker for the lovely talk. Thank you.